Smith scores again for Australia. Nice hit there. It's very reminiscent of the, the dodgems at a fairground when you see those head-on smashes. Yes. And the dodgems at the fairground, there's a sign saying no head-on crashes, but in uh, wheelchair rugby, there's no such sign. That's actually the preferred method. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever I talk about these wheelchair rugby games and I had the uh, experts alongside and had Dan Buckingham the other day, and uh, you guys just seem to revel in the big hits. Absolutely. Although you have to realize that going for a big hit, you can give up the play. So you have to know when to do it and when not to. I think we may have a foul. Is that Riley back in the sin bin? Yes. He tried to reach in there and pop out the ball. It's quite humorous. When they go into the sin bin, they play bad by Michael Jackson. <laughs> and you'll notice, too, there are two Japanese players sitting next to where Riley Bad is. He has to come in at a specific point, and they're containing him. So they forced him to inbound so he's not on the court now. It's a strategic move so that your best player is not available to get the ball. Hopefully creating a turnover. And he only stays in the sin bin until the other team have scored, and then he comes out. Or it's one minute. If a minute expires, he's okay. And that, that strategy was effective. Riley Bat wasn't able to get out with the ball. And it looks like Australia had to call a timeout. So just talk me through the timeouts. How many timeouts are you allowed? Each team has four timeouts for the entire game that they can call on the floor. And then there are two timeouts that the coach can call from the bench on a dead ball. You can't use those to save yourself in a situation where you would have a turnover. So you gotta, you gotta work carefully with them, but anytime you use a timeout to prevent a turnover, then it's a good timeout. So now you see Japan putting up a wall in front of their goal area, which is called the key, I believe. Exactly. Looks like EK's got a flat. I should learn his actual name. Ikezaki. I think we'll stick with EK, it's easier to say. It is. And you'll see a lot of these running repairs. The chairs do take a bashing. And it's a bit like Formula One. Someone comes along, just takes the whole wheel off and puts a whole new wheel on. And Australia's setting up a play here. Nice work there. So we saw the, the two in front charging like a battering ram, shielding. And then they, they spread out to draw away the defense to open up the key so that Pat could pick a hole and, and go through. Fascinating game, isn't it? Here's EK to equalize for Japan, that's 7 all. It's very much bat against EK. A little bit of the who there, who are you? Fans of CSI will enjoy that. And Erdem it is this time that needs a new wheel. I was surprised at how little music from English bands that I've heard this weekend. You know, there are uh, 25 songs that they rotate through at Wheelchair Rugby in the stadium, and yeah. I think The Who might be the only English band. Well, that's a shame. So many great English bands. Yeah, from the um, closing ceremony of the Olympic Games, we had a just whole procession of... Uh, uh, British bands. So let's see, that's Nirvana, they're from Seattle. Correct. Um, we had Michael Jackson, who's obviously American. Uh, I haven't heard Queen yet. If we heard Queen, they're, they're British, of course. Uh, but they do play We Will Rock You. Yeah. EK with another score. Keeping it close. And as they know well, the winner of this game plays for the gold. And it literally is end-to-end -end stuff. One team scores, the other team equalises. Smith and Bat getting all the points for Australia. And it's uh, EK mainly scoring for Japan. And as you can see, the Aussies all in the golden green. Here's EK, dominant player for Japan, coming over the halfway line.
slowing it down a little bit. He's setting up a play. Australia's got a four-man key set up there. Snake eyes, as we call it. And why do you call that snake eyes? Well, normally, the defending team is only allowed to have three players in the key. So most of the time when you set up in the key, you have three inside and one out front. With that defense, you have two in and two out. Why they call it snake eyes, I guess. Two and two. Two and two. And it's 9-9 nine, nine again. The bad from Michael Jackson tells us that uh, Shin is going to go into the sin bin. Or the shin bin. He played uh, a couple seasons in the United States just recently. Uh, I think it's helped his game a lot. He played for Coach Gumbert, who is the Team USA coach. In, on his club team. So is this a big game in the States? Very big. We have over 40 teams. So lots of players, lots of opportunity to play, which is why we allow an international player on any, any of the club teams so that the rest of the world has the opportunities that we do. Because I can play in 15 tournaments in a year without any difficulty. Hmm. Whereas I know uh, it's a lot more difficult Unless you're in it, like in Europe, where cities are closer together, you can probably get in more tournaments. But I would expect a country like Australia doesn't have the opportunity to play in tournaments like I do. EK from Japan coming forward again. Um, I'm not sure if that's Snake Eyes or not. It's two and two, but they're a little bit... It's kind of a mess right now. Yeah, a bit of a mess. No one can get through. There's a big gap on the outside, but Bat's the man covering it. Looks like the defense worked there. And is it a professional game? Uh, nobody gets paid to play at this point. But you've got a smile on your face that suggests that it's, uh, there are incentives. Well, if you know what this, if it's a sport that people know about and they want to watch, then yeah. corporations get interested and start spending money and yeah. the best players get rewarded. Uh, you'll see that even in the United States, it's not necessarily that people get paid, but there are teams that that are perpetual contenders, and they have funding. So 11-9 to Australia. And are your team one of the better teams? Uh, we're, we ranked 16th last year, which isn't bad out of 40 teams, but we certainly like to do better. I'm watching this here, will lots of these players then get picked up for, for the big leagues? Well, and... Any team is welcome to pick up a player. It's really about, for somebody coming into the States, finding a place to stay, finding uh, possibly a job, because the season's eight months long. Japan defending now. Another play coming up from Australia. Fast man coming in from one side, and back coming in from the other side. And he finds his number 10, that's Chris Bond. If you look at these chairs, the, they run from four to $10,000. And they're built specifically for the player. There's uh, roughly 40 measurements that are made based on a person's physical stature, their physical abilities, and also their style of play. So if you turned up at a tournament and your chair had got missing on the flight or something, you'd be struggling with yes. somebody else's chair. You could, but it's not the same. Very patient play from EK waiting for the gap to appear on closest to us, 12-10 to Australia. We're in the last minute of the first quarter of the opening semi-final here at London 2012. Riley Bat, dodging, really slippery. Well, he's the man of the match so far, isn't he, MPV? He is in most matches. Yeah. He's uh, scored most of those points from Australia, Bat and uh, Smith's got some of the others. Bond we saw as well, and EK on the ball now. The most valuable player for Japan. And Japan can't score the last goal here. Australia's going to get another possession. Just explain to me again why it's so important to get the last goal. If you can score the first goal and the last goal of every quarter, that's, that's four points you've already gained an advantage for. And if you have the possession error in your favor, which is based on the jump balls, you get the ball at the beginning of the next quarter. So that can be a two-point turnaround there, too. So you'll often see teams slow it right down and try and score just at the end of the quarter. 
but uh, this is why Bat's so desperate now to get get over. And now that he has fear position, he'll take his time. So that will mean Australia will get possession at the start of the. No, the possession arrow controls that. All that means is they get the last goal of the quarter. Assuming Japan has an opportunity here. The clock doesn't start until a player touches the ball. But it took so long to transition there yeah. that they really didn't have a chance. No. So you have to be ready for that. Yeah, 14-11, Australia lead at the end of the first quarter. And they're looking the stronger team. It's almost like a one-man show from uh, EK of Japan up against them at the moment. Well, they've made less mistakes. That's really the key here. The turnovers that are being created by Australia's defense. Just have a look at some of the plays from the first half. And we can see that uh, Bat, as he goes along there, he's allowed to just put the, the ball between his legs on the chair there. But it has to be at a certain height so people can get at it. Well, two-thirds of the ball needs to be exposed so that other players can reach for it. And there can't be anything over the top of it. You can't put a strap over it or anything. Some of the goals and some of the big hits from the first quarter. It's very quick, isn't he, Bat? And also very, very good at swerving. Very good close control. Yeah, he's very fun to watch. So what would the Japanese coach be saying to his players now, do you think? Well, I think the key for Japan is to control the ball, not, not have unforced errors. Because Australia will make mistakes, and Japan's defense will create turnovers, but if they give the ball away as much as they did in the first quarter, they'll never make this up. Your top caliber teams don't turn over the ball very many times. Five, seven, maybe ten in a whole game. We're having the first Mexican wave of the session going around the hall. And everyone stands up. You can see it's a packed house. Have you been impressed by the crowds that are following the wheelchair rugby? Wonderful. Uh, loud, ex exuberant. Very friendly. And there we see back coming in again. Australia starting the second quarter as they ended the first 15-11. Nice job pulling down that pass. We'll give and go. Loose ball. Looks like Bond is able to he really thought that was going to be his. He got the chair position so that uh, Sheen couldn't get to it. But they're going to say that was off an Australian player because Bat did get a piece of it. Now, for people watching this, thinking of taking up the sport, um, what, or maybe you know, thinking, I wonder if this is for me or whether wheelchair basketball is for me. What, what would you say are the different skills required with those two different sports? Well, really. For rugby, it's a quadriplegic sport, and that means that you need to have impairment of some sort in all four limbs. There are many players who play both. Um, if it looks interesting, it's worthwhile just to come out to a practice, find a team near you, and give it a shot. You can always play at practice if you don't qualify to play in, in tournaments. So 16-11 now to Australia. The crowd beginning to get noisy. And Japan need to find a way back into this game. At the moment it's Australia heading for the gold medal match against the winners of the second semi-final, which will be between the United States and Canada. A real local derby there. And Japan had to call a timeout there because they, only, they have only 10 seconds to inbound the ball. And Australia's defense was solid, forcing them to time out. They're talking about it a little bit, see if they can set up a play to get the ball in, get it across half court. Just looking ahead to that America-Canada game, 
uh, the American captain saying we have tactics for every team, but Canada always bring the game to us. Yes, uh, <laughs> in, it's one of those rivalries where regardless of where one team is ranked over the other, it's always close, it's always a battle. And I expect no less tomorrow or tonight. Japan getting one back. Cutting the lead down, 16-12. Australia moving the ball quickly. At the World Championships two years ago in Vancouver, the US and Canada played where Canada led right up until the last 10 or 12 seconds. And the USA got up for the very first time at the very end and, and won the game. So you, never, you can't count either team out. A couple of big hits there. audible gasps from the crowd at the uh, magnitude of those hits. Does it hurt when you get knocked down? It can, uh, but you learn to fall gracefully if you have the opportunity. And Bat battling his way through there. How do you fall gracefully, David? Well, hopefully you fall slowly <laughs> so you have the opportunity to think about it. Yeah. Um, but a lot of times, especially if you're carrying the ball, you're more interested in either calling a timeout or getting rid of the ball so you don't lose possession. Big hit from the Aussie, and this time it's him that goes over backwards. Mostly protect your head and your elbows. People might be surprised that you don't have to wear a helmet in this game. Bat up so quickly there, he nearly took the referee over. The hardwood floors are pretty soft compared to a concrete. And is this the sort of floor you'd usually play on as a, a basketball court? Ultimately, yes. Uh, we do sometimes play on rubberized floors, but they're very slow. Mm. It looks like the game's being played in slow motion. Smith getting through there. Sorry, uh, Chris Bond getting through there. And there's a little bit of spring in those wooden floors, isn't there? For, but, uh, just enough. Just enough to take the bang off your head, <laughs> whereas the concrete doesn't. So Australia building a big lead now, 19-13. Oh, he's going to get a spin there. Number 10, that's Bond, is going to go in the sin bin for that. When you hit someone from behind like that, they call it a vertical spin. Often you'll see when you get hit from behind, the front end will go up in the air because your weight is set so far back. And again, that's about danger. You know, to the player safety. So the tune of Michael Jackson tells you that Bond is in the sin bin and he's been bad. And uh, we'll enjoy watching the thriller. 1914 now to Australia. Second semi. Second quarter of the first semi-final. Winners play either USA or Canada for the gold medal tomorrow. Back comes forward, Bond's with him. That's going to score. most of the points for Japan and he's going to score again to make it 2015. Long pass. Battle catch it, but is he going to get it out? Oof. Oh. EK and Bart. Nice work. So in American football you'd call that a Hail Mary pass with that. Yeah, or in basketball we call it cherry picking. But he did throw it up there. He put he put bat out there to dry. He's able to come up with it and get the goal. It's called the Hail Mary because you throw it as high as you can and you pray somebody gets it. Absolutely. Nice bit of uh, backwards maneuvering there for really me nice. to get through the gap. That'll be off Australia. 
But Japan gets the ball back, but they don't get to reset the shot clock. So Bat just reached in there and pushed it off EK's lap. So that means the Japanese get the ball back. Right. And actually, even if it bounces off the chair of an opposing player, it'll count as a touch. EK just going through there like a snowplow almost, just battering his way through. Out of defense. Back going down the left wing. And coasting in for the goal. So looking very comfortable for Australia. 22 points to 16. Maintaining a five point lead. Kano getting one there for Japan. Trying to defend Riley Bad will wear you down. He just seems a lot quicker than anybody else around the course. Just his level of agility. You know, if, they get your, if you get your claws on his chair, he hops out of it. Um, he can turn on a dime. So difficult. So just looking at his classification, he's a 3.5. Now, what exactly does that mean? It means that he has, well, he has clearly has the highest function of anyone on the court. In most cases, it'll be somebody with good hand function, but his disability is more about his what he doesn't have in the way of hands. So he has a lot of trunk function, which is why you see him lifting up his chair or turning his chair without putting his hands on the wheels. Chris Bond, uh, also another 3.5. Whereas um, Japan, the highest class that they have is a 3.0. And uh, EK is one of those, uh, number seven. And as a 3.5, that means there's generally going to be someone who's uh, 0.5 on the other end of the scale and being the lowest functioning player. The people around you aren't as physically capable. So, for example, Ryan Scott, the uh, Australian captain, is a, a 0.5. Probably shouldn't use the word capable. That's not what I mean. But they don't have the, the muscles. And you have to add the scores together to make sure you, you can't... Eight or less. Can't go above eight. So uh, three and a half of the eight points for Australia are with Riley Batt. So he's almost half a team. He plays like more than that. So when Bat and uh, Bond are on together, they're both 3.5, which means the other players have to be 0.5 each. Correct. Which, um, which means there are only two people you're going to see with the ball most of the time. Yeah. Nice job. There wasn't much left on the shot clock there. They used it pretty much all of it. Very distinctive Mohican haircut. Japanese player sports. Riding Riley back to Chris Bond. Dominating though. He's got some big shoulders. He's a young player. He's uh, I think he's 26. And Riley Bat's only 23, so Australia will probably be a powerful team for a long time to come. And could you see Australia troubling either Canada? Or the United States, if they got certainly, uh, they give trouble to both teams. Out, they beat up Canada pretty bad early on. I believe that might have been the first game of the weekend. Certainly a lot of squawking from women in the crowd. I'm not sure why that was. Australia now leading by six, looking to make it seven. Bat just spinning. Just finding that Australia-Canada score, it was 64-52. Uh, 
They also beat Sweden 60-47 and Belgium 58-43. They played three, they've won three. And Japan also have won all of their games. Sorry, Japan lost to, lost to America, 64-48. They uh, beat Great Britain, 51-39. They beat France, 65-56. So I, I thought the Great Britain-Japan game might be a closer game. Mm. Yeah, I think there's a lot of disappointment that Great Britain uh, didn't get into a yeah. medal game. So it looks like at the moment we're on course for an Australia-America final tomorrow. But you can never tell. 27-20, just a couple of minutes left on this second quarter. Back gets a jump ball, gets his hands in there enough to uh, stop the opposing player from having control of what he's doing with the ball. So they'll call it a jump, and the possession arrow will determine who gets the ball. Timeout. Japanese player in, in jeopardy of getting a foul there for clearing out by lifting his arm. Clearing out, what does that mean? Well, if, if you lift the ball, you have a protected area in your lap. Mm. We call a cylinder. So anything from your lap up to the top of your head. If you have your hands on the ball and you're moving it around and you cause contact with the other player, the defender actually will get the penalty, not the person with the ball. But if you take your hand off that ball to try and push someone away or smack their arm off the ball, we call that a clear out. That's a, now you're, you're creating the contact and that's not in a protected area. Elvis Presley now, again, not British. And there's a kangaroo for Australia, enjoying the game. Kangaroo's the one on the right. I think he might have been in the uh, boxing earlier. Mm. Yes, they have a reputation for that. So, EK for Japan. Bat again. If they touch it, it's over and back. Oh, it must have tossed the Australian chair. That was sloppy, but they'll take it. It's six points. Pat put himself over there trying to push uh, Sheen across the line. He almost got it. When Pat picks the ball up like this, you know he's just going to go all the way through. This time he pushes it forward to number four, Josh Hose. And Hose returns the favor, gets it back to number seven, Jason Lees. So Australia trying out some new players now, just uh, using their squad. I think they've got the far enough ahead and they think they'll be resting some of the key players yeah, ready for they, the final. They seem confident. And the players on the bench are also great players. They wouldn't be here if they weren't. Locked in back there, didn't they? And that, was that illegal? As long as there's no physical contact made between players, that's totally fine. They call that a jump ball? Oh, maybe not. Nope. Sheen's in the box. That means that uh, they called contact. So one minute penalty. That's just going to run the clock down a little bit here. Just enough so that they know they can get one more possession out of this. That's pretty much most teams' target is around 50 seconds. She and the Japanese, they're going to try and score as quickly as possible. Shin completely taken out there. Just 
spin, and his feet are off the foot rest. It's gonna take a little while to get him put back together. <laughs> Why does that make you laugh? Uh, it's, it's just entertaining to watch him kick his feet around. Uh, most, many of the guys can't, can't move their feet. And the fact that they came off the footrest, they're just kind of dangling there. It's just, I just found it funny. And when you were playing wheelchair rugby yourself, when you crashed, do you, do you find that funny? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> as, long as, as long as nobody gets hurt, it's very entertaining. Shin's okay. He's up again. If he gets hurt, would it be a shin injury? Uh, maybe if he inflicted the pain, it would be a shin injury. <laughs> Who knows? So, EK with the ball. You'll find there's not a whole lot of political correctness between players in a sport like this. I get, I sense that. Kano and EK, crucial players for Japan. They have 14 seconds to score before half time. And UK will cross the line in his own good time. Used all of it that time. 2.8 seconds left. Just to make sure Australia don't have time to score. And I'd rather take a risk. He made sure it got inbounds. So that's half time. So we have five minutes for the players to get some water, get some coaching, take a breather. 29-23. We'll have a look at some of the big hits and some of the best goals from the first half. And how much uh, importance is there on taking on board fluids? I mean, it must be very hot out there. Oh uh, Yeah, you're working pretty hard. Uh, your arms are not your legs. So when you're running up and down the court, you're you're working up a sweat, and it's, it can be brutal. I've been told it's five miles of sprinting in a game. Now, I don't know if that's a real statistic or if it's somebody measured the length of the court and counted the number of points that get scored, but it kind of gives you an idea for how much, how much pushing around there is out there. These guys are working really hard. Some of them are sweating. You can see the stats there, the important one, 29-23, the goals, four penalties each. We see all the different sorts of uh, fouls there. What, what's a flagrant foul? Flagrant foul is is exactly what it sounds like. It's a foul that um, goes above and beyond just a common foul, where you're either purposely putting someone in danger, or hitting someone after the line that puts them in danger. You know, if they score the goal, there's no reason to hit them. Um, or if they're already up in the air and you hit them, really no good could come of that. They're already. Uh, They've already been stopped. So the penalty there is three goals, potentially. Um, you have to sit in the box for either thri three scores or three minutes. And each minute starts after a goal is scored. So it's a big deal. And if you get two of those, they take you out of the game. That's very much the man of the match. Well, we like the big hits. We like to make them. We like to take them. Um, nobody's out to end somebody's career, cause them any serious bodily harm. Do you ever see serious injuries? Not often. You, you see, you know, shoulder wear and tear kind of things. People will occasionally get their fingers crushed if they get them down close to the, the bottom of the chair when another player is coming after the ball and they're reaching for it. Mm. Um, and then, you know, you, when you flip over, you can hit your head on a chair or hit your elbow on something, and those, those can be not fun. Most of them are your typical sports injuries. You'll see some of these guys sitting on the bench with a bag of ice on their arm or their neck or their shoulder. And we see them, a lot of them now, um, even though they could just be resting, they're just keeping warm, keeping moving. You don't want to seize up. These are your guys that are on the bench that are preparing, just trying to make sure they're ready to come out when their time is called. Uh, there's a player going around right now number 13, Shimakawa. He was actually the MVP of, of the United States League, uh, USQRA, several years ago. I think um, at my first national tournament, he received that award. So he's been playing for quite a while, 37 years old. 
It just shows you that the caliber of players on his team has improved as well if, if he hasn't seen the court yet. And it is a squad game. There's only four players on at a time, but there's a, a full squad of players, substitutes. That uh, How many substitutes are they allowed to use? Well, you can substitute as many people as you want at any time, as long as it's a dead ball. And the, between the 12 players, obviously, they've got a combination to make eight uh, many different ways in case of injuries or based on line effectiveness and who they're competing against. And just a reminder about those classifications, just looking down the Australian team, some of the 3.0s, 0.5s, 3.5s, 1.0s, 2.5s, the different classifications of impairment and always it has the four players must add up to eight points or less. So you've got to be a bit of a mathematician when you're the coach, haven't you? Because you might suddenly look up and think, oh, there's 8.5s on the court. Well, by the time you get to this level, you've only got 12 players to work with. You know which lines you want in which situation. These coaches sit and watch film all the time. They know what they're up against. They've seen all these teams several times. What would happen if you inadvertently put on nine points in of eight? It's a technical foul. And so one of the players has to go and serve a penalty in the penalty box. And you have to correct the mistake. So whoever you put in the box, the remaining three have to add up to eight or less with the guy that's serving the penalty. So we're underway again, the third quarter. Australia winning the first quarter 14-11, the second quarter 15-12. It's 29-23 overall. You're seeing a lot of new players here on the Australia squad. As well as the Japan squad. So Bond, Smith, Harrison and Erdem at the moment out there for Australia. No goal. Across the line before he had possession of the ball. So the first time we've seen uh, Agino of Japan, number five. So number 10, Sato, with the black headband. His first appearance of the semi-final. Seen a lot of Bond, a lot of Vats, and a lot of EK. And it is EK on the ball now, but he's a little bit boxed in. That's a foul. Bond being a little aggressive there. Most coaches would tell you not to reach in the backcourt like that because the, if you've got somebody stopped, they only have 12 seconds to get across. Um, basically now, Australia has given them an easy opportunity to score instead of a tough one. Chris Bond of Australia sometimes plays like James Bond, licensed to kill, and so he has to go and uh, sit in the sin bin. License revoked. <laughs> Straight back into the action. He should wear 007, really, but they've given him number 10. Number 7 is Jason Lees. Some good defense there. One of the advantages of forcing that kind of inbound is that the player in the corner has to come right in on the corner. So one player can trap them because the sidelines are also defenders in that situation. You can't cross the line to gain advantage. So good use of the court to trap the player. Went for the timeout. I don't know if he got it. So the timeouts can be called by the coach, but also by players on the court. Why, why would he want to call a timeout there? It's always to ensure that you don't lose possession of the ball. If you're getting knocked across the line, if you're going to violate uh, 12 seconds or 40 seconds. Rarely will you see someone call timeout just to slow things down. That's what the coach's timeouts are for. Australia extending their lead further, 30-24. On the man scoring all the goals. Now the bat's gone off. Ishito gets it out. To Shoji. Shoji gets it back. Bond deflects and catches. So 
I'd say Bond is a contender for man of the match now up against Bat. Yeah, he's he's definitely had a great game. Very aggressive player, Bond, isn't he? He's, uh, he's after EK all the time. Yes, he is. Well, that's his job. He's He's been set to work against EK probably for the entire match. Especially now that Bat's out. Big hit coming in there. Bond will cross the line. 32-25. I think one of the things that uh, amazes people watching for the first time is the noise when the chairs crash together. Now, these chairs are made out of aircraft-grade aluminum. Some of them are titanium, but most of them are aluminum. And the impacts are, are strong. You'll break the welds on those chairs. And if you can see them up, up close, they're pretty well vented up. Andrew Harrison getting on the score sheet for the first time. Someone who plays at this level is usually going to need a new chair uh, every year or two years from the beating they take. And are these all made by the same firm or are they specialist companies? There are several manufacturers, um, some in the US. Um, there's uh, one in Germany, there's one in uh, New Zealand. Actually, they've moved to the United States as well. Is it New Zealand or Australia? It's uh, Melrose. But they, there are a number of chair manufacturers. I know in the US we have at least four. And how much would a, a specialist chair for wheel, wheelchair rugby cost? They run anywhere from four to $10,000. And there are f a, around 40 different measurements that are made to make these chairs fit you specifically. But for people watching this and you know wanting to go to their local sports centre to try this, I mean, can you just do it in an ordinary wheelchair? Well, we originally started playing in, in ordinary wheelchairs, but the hits weren't as big either. Right. The rules have developed over the years as the equipment has tried to gain advantages with those rules, so I think they've refined it pretty well. Mm. But yeah, your chair would get destroyed. If, it, if I tried to play in this chair, I wouldn't be able to get home. Well, we wouldn't want that, though. Need to be able to get home. It's pretty nice here, but I do got to get back to my job. Yeah. 34 27. Have you enjoyed your time in London? Uh, very much so. Uh, people have been great. I, really, I like the city. Got out in the countryside, went to Wales for a day. 35 27. And, and you've obviously watched a lot of the wheelchair rugby. Have you taken in any other sports while you've been here? I've seen some track and field events. One of my teammates does javelin. Shot put and discus. Uh, he, he's a, a medal winner, so uh, yeah, shout out to my teammate Scott Severn. Congratulations. What did he win his medal in? Uh, he medaled in shot put and javelin. And he plays for your team in the wheelchair rugby back home? Yes. Excellent. So, timeout called. Bat's going to come back on. Bond's going to have a rest by the looks of it. So Australia pretty much changed their whole team there. Just Yeah, they're trying to get everybody some time. They all came out here to play. And I think this game is pretty well decided. At least in the minds of the coaches. I think the advantage that Australia have, because they've got the two very good players, Bond and Bat, is that they can swap them over, whereas EK of Japan is on all the time. He must be getting tired. He is. They have substitutions for him as well. But again, you know, one of those dominant players that if you can have him out there, you want him out there. Hanno just running into a bit of traffic. Doing a good job of protecting the ball. Bat's good at getting his hand in there. No way through for Japan at the moment. 
Cano just trying to bash her way through free kick. They're giving the penalty goal there. He pushed the player across the line. And it's all too easy at the other end, unfortunately, for Japan. They've worked so hard to get through the Australian defence, and then the Aussies can quickly just break away to score at the other end. Nice shot, Jason Lee's looking very not guilty. He was looking for a vertical spin. He got hit from behind and went pretty high up in the air. <laughs> oh. That's really when you're at your most vulnerable, when you're flipping up and flipping over backwards. Kano getting the point. Because you know there's a chair underneath where your head's about to go. Yeah. That must be a scary moment. It is. And then you start reaching for things, hoping to slow yourself down. Tamura and Nawashita on the sidelines. Might see them in action soon. Back for Australia against EK. Two of the strongest players on the pitch. British band, the Mighty Queen. Australian coach. Here comes Kano for Japan. Can't find a way through, Bats blocking him. Plays it back to EK. And EK finds a way through. That'll go uncontested. There's a pretty good pile up down there. Cody Meakin just on for the first time and scoring straight away. So this sport was, I believe, called murder ball when it was first invented, and a lot of people... We still call it that yeah, from time to time. When I said I was commentating the wheelchair rugby, friends friend said to me, oh, murder ball. Well, there was a documentary about the sport called murder ball. Yeah. That was actually, it was really entertaining. And I'm guessing that the International Paralympic Committee just wanted something a little bit more friendly sounding for the official games. Well, the rumor is that it's about corporate sponsors. You know, who, who's going to put money behind something called murder ball? But you, you start talking about quadriplegic rugby, then yeah. finding sponsors might get a little easier. I think it's quite, because you, you, you call it quad rugby, don't you, in the yes, States? Yes, wheelchair rugby or quad rugby. Yeah. Right. So I think um, oh, Cody uh, Meekin, who just scored for the first time, is now straight in the sin bin. I think it's quite canny, actually, to call it wheelchair rugby, but with the people in the know knowing it's called murder ball, so, you, so the corporate sponsors will come in. Uh, and also, you know... Uh, Hopefully. But, but the kids will still like it because it's got that kind of subculture. Right. And actually, in the United States, a lot of schools won't allow a, a kid to wear a shirt that says murder ball on it because it says murder. Yeah, and that's fair enough. So again, it's a, you know, it's a perception thing. Like we want it to be seen as a strong and an interesting sport, but not to the point where people are dying. No, you want a positive <laughs> message. You always want a positive right. message. <laughs> Just see a plaster on the players. Uh, Eyebrow there, just showing you. Well, they may not be murdered. There's quite a few injuries. Either that, or he's covering up jewelry. Oh, it could be a piercing. Could be. I noticed that uh, bat on his uh, earlobe covers up. Uh, right. People have had things ripped out, so they don't really want that to happen. That's no fun for anybody. So for the first time in the match, Australia have a 10-point lead. It's 41-31. Australia against Japan. Australia heading for the final where we expect them to play America. The second semi-final coming up later today uh, between the United States and Canada. Big local derby there. David's hoping the Americans are going to get it. Certainly I want to see my country come home with the gold.
I didn't understand there. Cano seemed to have a chance to to score there and opted to throw it backwards. Yeah, I, I didn't see how close he was. Well, maybe there was. I think he was jammed, possibly. And here goes Bat. Riley Bat. A 3.5 classification is from New South Wales. 23 years of age. Erdem Naz, number two, sitting there. We haven't seen him. Bat has also played in the United States. He played for a team called Sharp and uh, helped them bring home a national championship. You could clearly hear the tire on EK's chair pop there. It's a very familiar sound. As one of the three fives out there, I, uh, I lose tires all the time. So it, someone crashed into him so hard, his tire burst. Right. And these tires run generally between 110 and 150 pounds of pressure. You got to hit them pretty good. But the hardware on the front of that chair, that on low point chairs, it goes right over the wing and right into your rim, pop, pushes that tire. It's got to give somewhere. So 150 pounds of pressure. So on my mountain bike, I don't about 65 pounds. So it's quite a lot harder. Yeah, it's than more that. like uh, your racing bikes. Mm. Trying to decrease the contact patch, whereas on a mountain bike you want lots of contact so you have traction. Yeah. We're just trying to reduce friction. So EK for Japan. Nice job, uh, the low corner open up the corner there. Number 15, Kishi. Mikin for Australia, finds Bat, long pass up the field. And there is Jason Lees. Nice job there, corralling the ball and making sure he stayed in bounds. Turnover, An errant pass, picked up by Australia. So you see the Japanese subs there. They know that they're gonna be playing for the bronze medal match. Shin there asking for a call. Mikin reversing over the line. He had his hand on the ball, but he wasn't getting the jump call. He was very frustrated by it. You didn't get to see him look at the ref and say, hey, where's my call? He's obviously had a chat with the ref about it, so he's been sent to the sin bin. Be careful, Riley, there's a great big crocodile behind you. I wonder if the crocodile's name is Dundee. Indeed. Very good film, Crocodile Dundee. The sequel wasn't quite as good. No, it's hard to recreate the magic of anything, you know. Well, The Godfather 2, I think, was the only film that was better than the original. Uh, you'd be hard-pressed to find an, another sequel that was. Return of the Jedi prob was probably as good as Star Wars. Getting a little bit off-topic, though. <laughs> Well, we only have 13 seconds left in this quarter. And at one point, Australia were 10 points ahead. Japan have got it down, up, now up to 12 points behind. First quarter was 14-11, second quarter was 15-12. Crocodile's not moving at all. Back, enjoying the music. I think Riley Bat would be a rather large meal for that crocodile. So Japan will just uh, score here, run the clock down to make sure Australia can't return the compliment. One second left, that won't be long enough. Bat looking for the long pass. He'll wait till the last moment, see if he can get it, but. So the clock only starts once he touches it. So right. if, if he did, 
got the long pass a little bit more centrally, he could have just coasted over the line Absolutely. and got the points. But it was too wide, as he's just explaining to his teammate, he threw it too wide. And then he tried to get uh, the ball bounced off the opposing player so they could get another inbound, but you can't do that intentionally and get away with it. So 15-10 that quarter, it's 44-33. After three quarters, Australia heading for the gold medal match. Oh, he hit the player right in the face. I'm surprised he didn't get a foul for that. Poor old Cano. Bad actually hopped out of his chair. You can tell they feel confident if they're up watching the board instead of talking about the game. They'll be showing some of the big hits and some of the best goals from the third quarter. Hopefully we'll get a look at a few of those. Some running repairs to the chairs. The uh, support teams for these for these teams are, are phenomenal. The equipment and uh, people who are help with nutrition and health and uh, everything. They're just amazing. You get to this level that people have their own individual sports drinks to replenish the nutrients that they need and uh, all kinds of regimens that they have that are individualized. Pretty amazing. And are you hopeful after the exposure that the Games has given to wheelchair rugby that your sport will grow in the next four years? Absolutely. We'd love to see it grow. I've been part of uh, several excursions to South America to help spread the sport there. Um, Colombia. I've been to Argentina talking about a trip to Peru. So it's always great to add more players, add more teams. You know, we love it. Why not share it with the world? And it really changes people's lives. Uh, several people just come to my team to watch. And it's an opportunity to see what, what you can do. People don't realize that what their capabilities are until they see someone else who maybe is less functional than them do more than they ever thought they could. And you can translate the, the lessons you learn in sport to your everyday life. Uh, hard work and success and failure and you know, anything that you learn from those experiences, you can take with you. Shimakawa for Japan. Just uh, scoring a goal there, making it 44-34. And we're being watched all over the world on uh, Paralympic.org on the web, but uh, lots of TV stations across the world taking us as well in the Middle East and South Africa. Are, are, are those areas where wheelchair rugby can take There's off? been discussion. Um, I know that they've had conversations. We talked about a trip to Dubai. Um, but as far as I know, that got cancelled just because they didn't think that there was any way that a program could be developed there, that there wasn't any backing from the organization that was trying to set it up so yeah we're, we're always looking for opportunities anywhere so if anyone watching this on tv in the world would like wheelchair rugby to come to their country is there like a governing body that they can get in touch yeah, with yeah the iwrf international wheelchair rugby federation they've got a, a website it's iwrf.org they'll help you get going they'll help you figure out what you need they can help you find uh used chairs so you can start your program more uh, you know, without as much money to get people rolling. So we're in the final quarter, 7.22 to go. And uh, it's uh, Australia who are steamrolling their way through Japan. On course to the final, this is the semi. And it's uh, Canada against the United States in the second semi-final coming up later today. I'm definitely looking forward to that match. Bond scoring for Australia. the experience of Shimakawa there looking his way up court Shimakawa we haven't seen much of him but he's uh, scored already a couple in this quarter he's rested for much of the earlier part of the game and he's uh, another three point naught nice job there by Japan taking advantage of Bond being facing the wrong way and being close to that line the turnover 
So the lead's down from 12 points down to 10, but uh, it'll be too, too much for Japan to try and overturn. And if they get close, I'm sure that Australia will make some roster changes. So Shimakawa with Shin alongside him. Shimakawa's route to goal is blocked. And he ran out of time. Did he? I think the player actually went across the line. It looks like he might be going to the penalty box. Japan taking advantage of some of the lighter players in the corner. They're a lot easier to punch across that goal line or into the cone. Jason Lee is just having a new wheel to go on. He's having two new wheels. Are they very lightweight, these chairs? Uh, relatively speaking, yeah. Uh, you know, when they were made of steel, they were a lot heavier. Mm. Uh, the aluminum is definitely lighter, and the titanium ones are lighter yet. But for a player who handles the ball a lot or makes big hits, titanium is a little bit brittle for a chair for a guy like me. But a guy like Lee's, you, you'll see him in a, a titanium chair. And a guy with less function, if he can get a couple extra pounds off that chair, it's going to make him just that much faster. You're watching Wheelchair Rugby for London 2012 with me, Jeremy Nicholas, and David Mingen is my guest. In the fourth quarter, Australia, the stronger side here. Chris Bond scoring a lot of their points. Shamakawa of Japan. Determination on his face there. Australian coach just calling for effort right up to the final whistle. Hooter? Is it a whistle or a hooter? Whistle. Whistle. That's, a, that's the word we use. So uh, Naz Erdem now on for Australia, the number two with the long hair. And Ben Newton, the number one, first time we've seen him. And he's going to score. Nice welcome from the Japanese players with an early hit. Newton working that passing lane was hoping it was coming to uh, Shinkawa. There's Shin to Shinkawa. Newton blocks him off. Shinkawa comes back the other way and Newton can't stop him. Japan have now got it down to, to nine points, but it's straight back to ten. Chris Bond runs it over. Trading back and forth, easy goals at this point. blowing his whistle insistently not sure what we've got going on here equipment apparently so Kishi of Japan number 15 with the goggles so he has uh, some tape issues love coming off back just leaning back in his chair a job well done the Japan coach knows that his team will be playing for the bronze medal tomorrow late this afternoon it's USA against Canada to see who will play Australia in the final tomorrow you the, know, the Japanese players will be sitting on the sidelines along with the Australians to figure out who they get to play and I thought that might be a jump ball. You must make contact. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Shin in the sin bin. That's why Mitch is a referee and I'm not. Would you ever like to be a ref? 
Uh, I might. I think it would be a very difficult job. I assume it's probably very thankless. Yeah. Uh, we give those guys a hard time sometimes, and, but they, you know, especially the referees at this level, they're, they're consistent, and uh, you can count on them to make the right call most of the time. But I'm imagining during the game you don't always say that. Oh, I disagree with calls all the time, but I don't know that I'm right or wrong. I just certainly know what I want and the way I saw it. Yeah. So Shimikawa for Japan. There's Shin with the Mohican style hair. Kishi's up with him. Kano just reversing in. Only got 13 seconds left on the clock before they score or have to give away possession. And he does score. 39 for Japan, but 48 Australia lead. Sheen's been in there pretty much the entire game. Shin's a, a 2.5 is his category. Plays for the Okinawa Hurricanes. Great name. So another timeout. EK's going to come back on just for the last five minutes. In his last five minutes, they're playing for pride. They want to play some good rugby. They want to make sure that their their habits are what they want to be for the next game. There's only three medals available, and there's four teams playing for them. Nobody wants to be that fourth team. That's the Japanese side of the crowd. That's the Australian side of the crowd, and it's the Australian side that is smiling the, a lot more. So Kano to throw in to EK. Shin's well advanced. Kishi just going in for the block. EK no way through. Shin wanting it. And there comes Kano. Backward pass. And he just had to hope there was somebody there, and there was. Good defense there. Keeping the player out of the goal. It's Carr. Oh. Putting a roadblock in the way of Carr. The turnover makes it Japan's ball. So it was interesting, that, that pass that he did, because he just did it straight over the back of his head, completely the opposite direction. He knew the other player was out there. I figured if he gave it enough loft, probably that uh, he'd be able to get underneath it. Great play between Shin and EK. Lots of ball movement. Oh, this is good. And that's where it does seem more like rugby when they're uh, passing it around like that, passing and moving. The thing to remember about this sport is that even the best players are quadriplegic, so anytime you pass the ball, there's a pretty good chance that. Uh, the player you're throwing it to might not get it. So most coaches will tell you, if you can hang on to the ball, hang on to the ball. Smith getting the point, the goal for Australia. Some good defense there by Japan, but uh, Riley Back came in to save the day again. Good blocking from Australia. Two players in his way. EK disappointed with that call. One of the Australian players got their hand in there enough to get the jump and caused the turnover, basically. Possession arrow just wasn't in their favor. When he gets through there like that, you just want to reach out and grab his chair. So you've done everything you can. And of course, you're not allowed to do that. No. It happens occasionally. 
like they say, uh, it's not a foul if the ref doesn't see it. Fifty forty one, Australia against Japan in this first semi final at London twenty twelve in the wheelchair basketball. So fifty forty one, Australia, Japan. Ryan Scott in the box. Team captain. Looks like we have a turnover. Australia will take advantage. And that was a shorthanded goal. Of course, when two of your three players is Bond and Bat, and got a pretty good chance. Yeah. So a shorthanded goal is when you have a player in the sin bin. Right. So it's three against four. But because Bond and Bat are the, the two uh, strongest players, it's not that much of a disadvantage. But it tends to be the strongest players that go into the sin bin. But on that occasion, it wasn't. It's the aggressiveness that gets you those fouls. I think confidence and aggression kind of feed on each other. Cleverly worked by Ike using Kano to block the man so that Ike can get through. And it's a fascinating sport because Although just the one player there holding onto the ball, all the players that are not got the ball, they're all doing a vital role in the, the team. In terms of blocking, opening up routes, those stopping other people from getting in your way. Those are the guys that make guys like me look good. I don't have to be the fastest player out there if, if the guys picking for me are doing their job and we're communicating well. Two minutes 22 to go in this first semi-final. Australia are going to win it. Japan just playing for a bit of pride now. Shin finds Ike. Kano's up ahead. Ike will just try and get past Bat here. There's no route through. Shin comes on the dummy. And Ike gets through. Nice work. If he touches the cone as he goes through, is that then it's not a goal? If he touches the cone before two wheels cross the line, yes. But usually, if you're going in that corner, you can get the two castles across before the wing of your chair hits it. You gotta be careful, though. Just see the precision as he goes through there, how careful he is not to run into the cone. I'll stop the replay before we see. Riley Bat, who's in charge of uh, scoring goals and shouting. Good at both. Oh, oh, nice job getting that ball out. Yeah. Bond was blocking off uh, the route to He was going to push him out, out of bounds, which he did, but he didn't have the ball in his hands when he went out. And now they've got Kano wedged completely in here. So that was a real roadblock with Kano right in the middle of three Australians, nowhere to go. And not only did he have hands coming at him, but... He was close to the half court line and he got pushed. He knew if he got pushed across that, he'd be in trouble as well. Once you cross the line, you can't go back over the line. Right. And even if you just partially cross and somebody bumps you back, that's the end of it. Or you turn too sharp, they'll call you there too. Just a reminder, once you get the ball, you have 12 seconds to get it out of your own half and then 40 seconds in the other person's half to score. And you can't, once you cross the line, go back into your own half. So Japan scoring there, 53-43. Looked like Bat was stuck there, but it's 
Somehow he seems to get out of these situations. It's just the pace of the man. The big block from Bond on EK and back comes in to score. That'll be 10 seconds, no touch. You know, like I said, you have 10 seconds to inbound the ball. Uh, it has to touch a player in that 10 seconds. And because nobody touched it, Australia gets the ball right down by their goal. Massive hit in the corner there. Pat makes his way through and crosses the line as he's done so many times in this game. 55-44. Sato for Japan to EK. And it's a real roadblock in the key there. They can't get it across. Ten seconds in the key for Japan. And they'll turn it over again. Seems like quite a good tactic just to put three men across the key to stop the It does fill up a lot of space. Mm -hmm. um, and so most, most teams will try and draw as much attention as they can to one side so they can create a hole. Goal there by Ryan Scott, captain. Point fives don't score many goals. But Bat does and he scores almost uh, just a few seconds later. And again. So three goals there in about 30 seconds. 58-44. So can Japan get one back? There goes another tire. Did you hear the tire? Oh yeah. You learned that pretty well. Familiar sound of a tire bursting. Whose tire is it? So the last 20 seconds of this semi-final. And Naz, the point five, could have scored then. Bond, now here all he has to do is dribble once, and the game is over. Finishing touch by Riley Bat. And there it is, Australia have won through to the final of the wheelchair rugby. They've comprehensively beaten Japan here today and Australia will face the winners of the second semi between the United States and Canada. Riley Batt getting met many of the points, finished 14-11 in the first quarter, 15-12, 15-10, 14-12, overall 58-45, a comprehensive win for Australia. They're unbeaten in the tournament, four wins out of four. Japan lost just one group game to America. They will now play for the bronze medal match and the Aussies go through to the final. Handshakes all round. I think Japan battled there, but there was only going to be one winner, wasn't there? Yeah, they, they held as long as they could. Um, I think most people expected that the game would go the way it went. No surprises. Australia's been dominant. They've beaten every team they've played by double digits. And the Australian players just coming onto court to take the ovation of the crowd. It's been a packed arena here. As most events have been at London 2012. Wheelchair rugby, one of the first to sell out. It's been impossible to get tickets. And you can see lots of these people have either come from the other side of the world or there are Aussies who live in London. Plenty of Australians here. Lots of uh, Japanese fans as well. 
and just lots of uh, ordinary Londoners who are enjoying this tournament. And a good ovation for the Japanese as well. They still have a shot at kicking home the medal. I think they should be happy with their performance. They did the best they could. Just Australians, just one heck of a team. And um, whoever wins this next game is gonna have their hands full. So the Aussies go into the huddle. And we'll leave you with some highlights from the game. David, a pleasure working with you. Yeah, you too. Thank you. Good luck for your team when you get back to America. And thanks for watching Paralympic Sport TV. Here's some highlights of the match. <laughs>